So good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to see you all. I'm Claude Goldenberg. I um, have the privilege of chairing CTE. Uh, and this is the first of our CTE colloquium events for this year. Um, we're delighted, beyond words, to welcome uh, <coughs> Professor Emeritus Mike Atkin for a conversation we're going to have this afternoon. Um, Mike insisted that we have a conversation. He says, I don't want to do PowerPoints. I don't want to give a lecture. I want to have a conversation. So I'm going to do my best conversationalist impression. And if Mike starts asking me very difficult questions, I will turn it over to the audience for their participation. I'm going to say a few introductory words about Mike, whom all of you already know. As, as you know, probably Mike began his long and illustrious education career in 1948 as a science teacher in a Jewish day school in New York. Then he went on to teach in the public schools of New York. As he finished his PhD at NYU in science education, he moved on to his first academic appointment as assist assistant professor at the University of Illinois, where he stayed for nearly 25 years, eventually being dean, before that associate dean for research. He came to Stanford in 1979 as professor and dean, and his most recent promotion was to professor emeritus in 2004. Uh, Mike has engaged in and written about a very wide range of topics, certainly science education, program evaluation, curriculum development, the role of government in schools and classrooms, formative evaluation, summative evaluation, summative assessment, university school collaborations, action research, teacher education, educational change, educational policy, the list goes on as all of you already know. Most recently he's addressed environmental education and the role of the humanities in education research, specifically science education research. These are the topics of the two most recent papers which I sent around a couple of weeks ago. He's a national associate of the National Academies of Science. He has a long, distinguished career, and I might add, still counting, as the flyer points out. He is a renaissance man in the education world. Uh, toward the end of his tenure at Susie, as Susie Dean in the mid-1980s, he was called an education leader, insightful, knowledgeable, participant in shaping the character and education in this land. He was described as informed, humane, intelligent, sensible, Someone who would rank on any small list of national figures concerned with the state of public education in America. As Charlie Rose would say, I am pleased to welcome him to this table. Thank you very much. Mike, thanks again for joining us for this. I've been looking forward to this for about a month or two, I think, since we first set it up. You know, in thinking about the... Uh, your long list of accomplishments. I was, I was going to start out with a really softball question, <clears throat> like, um, what common themes or threads do you see in your life's work? But, but I got to tell you, something else struck me. I've got to ask you this instead. Is there anything you haven't done, <laughs> and maybe wish you had? And before you answer that, if you want to talk about themes and threads, that's okay too. <laughs> um, I prefer that we get right into it. But I want, before we do that, I want to thank you for taking the time to actually read lots of the things that I, I mean, things that I don't think about very much anymore, like that book that's on your, uh, on the table, which we worked on a long time ago. And some of the people in this room have worked on it, worked on it with you. That's right. So thank you very much for, and thank you very much for accommodating yourself to this format. I've never done it before, so if we all flat, you know, fall flat on our face, there's still food outside. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you. So seriously, is there anything you wish you had done that you haven't? You know, I've never made plans. I, uh, I suppose I've positioned myself to take certain kinds of opportunities. But I, um, it seems to me, now that you ask me to think about it, is that I've fallen into everything I've done. Now granted, I had the background to take advantage of the things I fell into. But uh, I had no way of knowing, for example, that uh, after some work in, uh, at the OECD in Paris, uh, after I left the deanship here, I run into David Thomas, who was a staff person at the OECD, in the TWA lounge, there was a TWA in those days, in the TWA lounge at uh, Dulles Airport. And he says, Mike, I'm starting a new project. We're looking at science education across several different countries. Could you play a lead role in this? If I had not met David in that TWA lounge, 
my career would have taken a somewhat different path. So I'm, I never planned to be a dean. I mean, I never planned to be a professor. It was easy to be a professor in those days, not like today. Uh, at the end of World War II, um, and getting toward 1950, um, universities were expanding very, very rapidly. So if you had a pretty good pulse rate, you had a chance of getting a job at a good university. Fortunately, my pulse rate was okay, so. Well, I suspect you're being a little too modest. I mean, after all, wasn't it Louis Pasteur who said, chance favors the prepared mind? And yours was, I suspect. And but you don't know how to prepare your mind, so. <laughs> Anyhow, I don't want to push the luck thing too far. <laughs> but um, I, it, I, I'm really persuaded that uh, a lot of what happens in your life, some of the most important things, you have no control over, like the year you were born, whether there's a war, a depression, what have you. And all those have an influence. All those have an influence. As your life plays out. And career. you don't plan to do these things. Right. right. <clears throat> okay. Well, clearly one of the threads, so I'm going to push on one, of, on one of the threads here, clearly one of them has been the interplay, or you might say tension, I'd be interested in how you characterize it, between research and practice, right? The demands and the desires of being an academic in an academic institution. Uh, what that represents, what that requires, what that demands of individuals on the one hand, and also the um, uh, versus what you might call the, the practical imperative, right? The need, the desire, the wanting to actually be engaged in the world, do something of practical consequence and significance, make a make a difference, improve schools and for families and, and students and teachers. It's been an ongoing issue, obviously, in high-profile schools such as Stanford for, for many years, and you've been really at the vortex, and I say vortex purposefully, of this particular issue for uh, for a long time, uh, first as Susie Dean, not first, but prominently as Susie Dean, trying to not only maintain the teacher education program, but really to expand it. And then in a related project, the Stanford and the Schools, the, which come, among many things that culminated was this book, where you actually tried to bring the world of research and practice together and experience those tensions. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about these two career hot points of yours, you know, becoming the dean and trying to reset the balance between basic social science research and applied practical work in the schools, number one. And number two, your work with the Stanford in the School Study, which was sort of the same project, just in a somewhat different venue. Yeah, well, for, particularly for a professional school. I mean, presumably, uh, that's what several schools are at Stanford, and including the School of Education, at least I thought so. Um, which means that you relate to a profession. You don't solely do research in hopes that uh, you, you can relate to a profession by solely doing research. But I, in most professional schools, there's a strong element of involvement with practice during professional training. Um, you know, one of the um, interesting things is, I think, is that whatever reputation I had as dean at the University of Illinois, for 10 years was probably in building up the research capability of that institution. And the, it struck me when I got there as um, perhaps too involved, not producing enough research that raises broader questions, gets to some key issues that the profession may not be thinking about that. And I think, you'd have to ask Hans Weiler, who is co-chair of the search committee, but who couldn't be here today, but um, I think Stanford thought it was bringing somebody in who would really emphasize the research side of the institution. Well, they, they weren't, because when I got here, I saw a faculty composed of sociologists, anthropo distinguished sociologists, philosophers, anthropologists, etc. And by and large, they saw their work as doing research in, say, anthropology, mention a great example, George Splendor, um, and really important activity that had effects on the schools, but not necessarily beginning to work with people who were preparing to go into this field, but people who might be expected to use the results of these research, of this research. So, um, uh, and that's what Stanford valued when I got here the most. Not that it doesn't now, it does. But the practice side was not looked at that seriously. 
As a matter of fact, um, there was a committee established, Ed Bridges chaired it, the year before I came here, and they were split about whether Stanford should have a teacher education program or not. And it could well be that the most important thing I've done to this institution, I did before I got on the payroll, because Ed called me the summer before I came, two months before I came, and he said, Mike, we could go either way on this teacher education <coughs> program. We could recommend that it be dropped, because it was very small um, at the time, uh, or we could recommend that we try to bolster it, build it up. I said, Ed, what's a school of education without a teacher education program? Yeah, yeah. And so, Ed, <laughs> that's what happened. <clears throat> Did I say something funny? <laughs> you said something right on point. I think. <laughs> so we, um, on a record, a whole bunch of Ned and Nell noddings, uh, with support from my office, began to build that program. And today, and then Lee Schulman came to the faculty, helped to, uh, to boost it further. Um, eventually, Linda Darling Hammond came. And it's one of, it's a, I think, a, one of the most important aspects of the school today. But it could have gone another way. Right. So it's sort of interesting. I mean, you, you, I guess I hadn't thought about it this day, way, but when you got to the University of Illinois, you saw not enough focus on scholarly inquiry. It was very practical, very in the schools, in the trenches, working on practical problems. And so it's really the balance that you're after, right? Rather than pulling towards one end or the other. You pull toward the end that seems to be getting short shrift. Let's put it this way. I don't know about balance, uh, but both things should be valued. And to use, again, a Lee Schulman term, maybe, what's the scholarship in teaching? And he did a lot to, I think he came in, I, unless he walked out already. <laughs> um, um, I, he, he can't speak for himself, but he, he played a major role um, in helping us to understand wisdom in practice. Um, and Ju Judy Schulman, is Judy here? Um, Judy Shulman made a starting case studies right. that people could begin to examine. Uh, case study is used in professional schools very heavily, you know, particularly in uh, in some business schools, in law school, and I like to think that here we've made contributions to understanding the role of cases in developing uh, professionals. So, how would you care? I mean, I use the term. Interplay. Then I said, well, maybe it's a tension. I mean, how would you describe the relationship between the, the working on the practical problems of a profession, on the one hand, and making contributions to scholarly academic inquiry on the other? I mean, do you see them as separate? Do you see them as a? How would you describe the relationship? <clears throat> Yin and Yang, two sides of the same coin. Yeah, you know, I think it's a uh, it's highly interactive. That's the question. Uh, suggests. Uh, I'd hate to be at a place where they didn't think about larger issues, look at longer term questions, um, understand, appreciate, know how to use the, um, the social science, the humanities that are related to this particular field. So when I think of scholars who have, <coughs> now that I think about scholars who have influenced me, it's in philosophy, it's in history, Right. You mentioned specifically in, in your papers and in our conversation, uh, Martha Nussbaum, the um, analytical philosopher at the University of Chicago, who you described as an Aristotelian activist, or activist Aristotelian, one of the two. Well, she's uh, <laughs> like some people, what's the term that's used? A public intellectual. Uh, so she gets involved in, uh, in race issues. In, I never met the woman. Coincidentally, but I did meet her once when she... She didn't take me very seriously at all, you should know that. <laughs> she, she thought my question was at some superficial level, which it probably was. But anyhow, I worship her from afar. And uh, yes, Her Fragility of Goodness, uh, a book she did in the um, mid-80s, was an enormous influence on me intellectually. What was it specifically about that that made such an impact? Well, she talked about the role of luck in human affairs. Um, her, a lot of her work is about um, luck in Greek tragedy, 
for example. She was a she was a classicist originally. She was a classicist originally. She was a classicist. She was a philosopher, and uh, you know, things that you can't control. But how do you then have to deal with them? And in her book, The Fragility of Goodness, chapter ten is called Non Scientific Deliberation which is a term I like very much, because some of the most important policy issues that have a lot of science associated with them can't be resolved solely by the science that pertains, because there are questions of value, there are questions of opportune moments. Um, so she's been, another big influence on my life since we got into, I'm thinking about that now, is Stephen Toulman. Um, and he died recently. Roy P. was uh, very close to him, incidentally, right. and wrote a magnificent uh, obituary for him for one of the British papers, The Guardian, I think. It's wor well worth reading Roy P.'s, um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, obituary for Stephen Tillman. But his earliest work that I know of was um, jointly done with a man named Johnson, and it was called The Abuses of Casuistry, The Study of Cases. And they laced into the Jesuits about making fine points about uh, in trying to understand um, certain kinds of, uh, of situations. But he says cases, he makes a very good, I understood the first 90 pages, and then the rest I, it was way over my head. Probably still would be if I were reading it now. But talked about a theoretical basis for using cases in, um, in uh, creating knowledge. So it was, and then he went on to do, uh, uh, Toulmin did um, Cosmopolis and Return to Reason, which is a very accessible book that I would recommend. Not so much what the science says about something, but what's reasonable in this situation. Um, uh, I don't believe that book has received the attention it deserves. Yeah. It, the book, uh, Return to Reason by Toulmin was done in uh, the early, to about 2000, about 2000. Well, you know, your, your humanistic roots are, are showing very clearly, so which brings me to one of the topics I wanted to bring up with you here. One of the recent papers, the what is the role of humanities in science education research, um, where you very wryly observe, few observers would claim that the results of education research are eagerly awaited by teachers, schools, administrators, and those who work at shaping education policy, or by the general public. Um, and you suggest that education research would gain more credibility if it paid more attention to education's humanistic roots, not just its scientific basis or bases. First of all, would this be a fair summary of your point? Yes. Okay, so I passed the first test. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a terrific paper in, in many, many respects. Um, but what, what I was curious about was, you're obviously arguing for a shift in, the, in how educational research is typically premised. How much of an up uphill battle would it be to really engineer, if that's the right verb, this shift? I don't know that you could engineer a whole lot in education. Uh, again, I think consistent with what I might have said earlier, um, you fall into opportunities. Um, my most recent interest, as I think you said at the outset, is in environmental education. And my God, there's an area where the science is so clear, um, but uh, it's not at all obvious what people are going to do about it. Um, it's a field, uh, my paper, that I think you distributed on yes. environmental education. Next on my list. <laughs> um, the, uh, that particular paper um, <coughs> draws on philosophy, history, uh, in particular, I think, and it points out that these are matters of how people act in specific situations. There are interests at stake, so you need to understand the interests, the values that people bring. History helps with that. Philosophy, certain <laughs> kinds of philosophy can help 
uh, with that. Um, but it's an urgent matter. It also needs, well, on this campus, Pearl, uh, Paul Ehrlich, um, maybe a month ago, was quoted in the campus, what do we call the campus? The Stanford Report. Um, he said, well, this, you know, it's, it's well, well and good to put up a solar panel, necessary. But the urgency is so great about protecting the planet that what we really need is a social movement. So how does this, so when, he, when I read that, I thought of the WCTU, I thought of women's suffrage, um, as uh, the kinds of things that don't proceed by science and logic. They proceed because there is a social movement that generates an ethos where these things can begin to happen. It really is an urgent matter. So you're saying in the, in the areas of science, specifically environmental science, the science is clear. I mean, the, the knowledge that we have, with all the uncertainties, ambiguities, and quarrels and so forth, there's enough science to really move ahead. And it's really a political, philosophical, a matter of will, shall we say, as to whether we actually act on it. Yes. And how do those things develop? Well, I don't know as much as I now, I think, should know about the women's suffrage movement. But uh, that was percolating for I don't know how many decades. But when it happened, it began to happen quickly. Um, and affirmative action at another level is uh, an example that eventually be began to move relatively rapidly. And how to uh, step, how to deal with that, I think, is an absolutely central issue for the people who live on this planet. Right. Well, what about, I mean, in, in terms of education, uh, you know, instruction and curriculum, do you think we know on, a scientific, on, on scientific terms what we need to know in order to move forward, and it's a matter of will, or are there still some things that we really don't know? I don't want to, oh, sure. I don't want to downplay the science. And there are certain things, by no means, so I was a science teacher for X years, um, no, no, it's, um, it's, I guess another way to try to say it is that the modes of thinking that are associated with science advances are not sufficient. <clears throat> don't ex I don't think any scientist any longer expects somebody to immediately apply the results of a piece of uh, research. But the science research is essential. But it's not enough if you want to change behavior broadly. And there you've got to involve people emotionally. <laughs> They've got to, I mean, I don't know how to do it. But I think it's something, I mean, this is, yeah, this is one reason I'm Nicole's student these days. Because she's got this very exciting to me uh, group on, uh, some of them are here. Any of them here? <laughs> this is Nicole Ardwan, for those of you who are not familiar. Um, and I'm learning so quickly um, by a group of very competent graduate students and faculty from many different departments. It's, it's, again, it's you, you never know what you're going to move into, but I'm moving into this. Right, right. So. But I mean, I, I'm intrigued by this notion, this, this <coughs> argument that you make that, because you begin with the statement, with a very strong statement, which I quoted before, that most people don't seem to take education research very seriously and they, I mean, are hardly waiting in the wings to see what the latest issue of the American Educational Research Journal happens to produce. And your suggestion is <coughs> if we were to sort of rebalance the formula, so to speak, that we have more of a humanistic grounding for what we do in education, educational research, it would help maybe center it, maybe give it more, more, more credence, maybe more intellectual heft, more, more credibility, more believability. By getting involved, um, now here's where that book might come into this conversation. Um, one of the things that I did and that you know is, uh, again, fortuitously, um, I came, I was hired by, I was the second choice of the president who, as dean. Uh, I was the second uh, choice as dean. He handled me beautifully, incidentally. Um, <coughs> Good thing, too. Dick Lyman. Um, Oh, this is worth a, an aside. Sure. Uh, for those of you who are, might want to be administrators, um, I knew that I was on the short list, in fact, a short list of two people uh, to be the dean. Um, and 
Dick Lyman calls me one day and he says, look, the search committee sent forward your name and that of somebody else. <clears throat> um, I'm going to go to this other person first. But I want you to know that if that doesn't work out, I'm going to come and ask you to be dean. And he did. And I did that ever since with uh, candidates who came in for, uh, for interviews. Let them know where they, uh, where they stood. That is perfectly acceptable. Uh, but we're going to somebody else first. It's a better way to do business. So well, transparency. How did we start this? Well, I don't know. I think it's a good uh, lesson. I mean, transparency is, uh, I would say, probably an important value for you. Yes, yes, an administrator. Good idea, I think. But, you know, it didn't occur to me independently. Right. Maybe right. wait another few years of my right. But I was learned... also thinking transparency in the context of... Oh, here's where I started. Yeah. Here, yeah. Now I know where I was going. Um, the, um, he is followed by John, uh, by John Kennedy. And it turns out that Don Kennedy has an enormous interest in the schools. And so, yes... Uh, very controversial during my deanship, as you know, but we got into uh, what we call the study of Stanford and the schools, in which professors, not only in the School of Education, but elsewhere, or they might have had courtesy appointments, like Sandy Dornbush, right. but uh, people within the School of Education, Mike Kirst, uh, Mike Garrett, um, uh, Larry Cuban was involved. <laughs> Well, Larry Cuban inherited it. <laughs> what happened? Well, he certainly mentioned the book. <laughs> Elliot's in the book. Yeah, that's right, Elliot. Um, Lee? And quite a, anyhow. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Ed Hart. Ed, 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 Ed's mentioned. Ed was... Uh, 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 the, the, like, he did uh, part on test, testing and assessment. But it lived on uh, after the study of Stanford and the schools because of Larry saying, well, he'll, he'll take it on. And uh, he and Beverly Carter... Um, the Stanford Schools Collaborative, is that what it was called? And they, we issued book. I worked in that too, uh, after my deanship, with a group of mentor teachers. And we got into action research and mentor teaching. Um, it was very stimulating for me. I learned a heck of a lot. Am, am I on talking? You are about? absolutely on talking. In fact, I, you know, I, just, I noticed as I was, I mean, I've had this book on my bookshelf for a number of years, and I recently pulled it down, and, and I just, a couple days ago, noticed that I don't see if you can, I don't think you can see this, but there's this big red S in the middle, which presumably stands for Stanford, not schools, and this S is sitting in the middle of this big labyrinth, right at the center of this labyrinth. I'm, I'm sure that wasn't accidental. It wasn't my intention. I had, I had, I had no, no, I had no voice in the cover. Of I mean, not to engage in abstruse semiotics or anything. But what's the significance of big red ass in the middle of this yellow labyrinth? We're still lost. <clears throat> That's one hypothesis. No, honestly, I mean, what? Well, you know, what significance um, would you, you know, Stanford has a history that a lot of people yeah. don't know, and. Um, that is that um, Jane Stanford in particular, um, at the outset, but uh, Leland of course as well, um, saw this from the beginning as a place that relates to the community, that's embedded in the community, that influences the community. And their inspiration was uh, not Harvard, not Yale, not Penn, where they visited, uh, as they were figuring out how to build a university to memorialize their dead son, who dies at age 15. Um, but um, they, when they, people at these institutions began to learn of their interests, they said, well, you should go to Cornell. The reason you should go to Cornell um, is that when the Land Grant Act, soon after the Land Grant Act was passed in the middle of the Civil War, um, the uh, the big land grants grew up in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Illinois was one of them, and many others. Um, but Illinois, uh, but Cornell said that uh, it would take on agriculture as a land grant function. To this day, the College of Agriculture is uh, has a separate. I think to this day, certainly to a decade ago, it was uh, administered somewhat differently from the rest of Cornell, and not incidentally, education is in the College of Agriculture at Cornell University. Um, but the point being here, that and they, they like that. And Cornell, it turns out, if you look at their history, 
had a relationship with Indiana University. Um, and so much of what the Stanfords did in creating this place, in building this place, was to go to Indiana and take the president, David Starr Jordan, uh, bring, uh, bring him here, Coverly, who was first uh, head of the education school, and um, what was he, superintendent in Indianapolis? Uh, San Diego. Pardon? San, San Diego? Diego? San Diego. No, Coverly. Yes. He was I superintendent in San Diego. San Diego. But he, 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 he was a small town superintendent in uh, Indiana. Mm. That's okay. That's You're right, I, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Good, we Not established always. that. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, you talk about that. It was, I mean, it's part, that was part of the really the, the intellectual, even maybe vocational background of this. Of That's this right. Work. So one of the first schools at Stanford is the School of Mining. It's now Earth Science. Right. Herbert Hoover graduated from right. the School right. of Mines. Right. He was an engineer. Incidentally, it was co-ed. Hmm. Very unusual for an elite private school in the late uh, 1800s. Right. So interesting. It has very different roots from very different roots from what we associate with sort of elite private institutions. And you make that point very clearly in your... Oh, good. In your and some public economy. institutions. Yeah, some public, right. Exactly. I mean, Berkeley, for example. Right. Entirely different ethos. Right. The, um, well, when I was dean here, um, Mike Heyman, a man named Mike Heyman, was the chancellor at Berkeley. And they were on the verge of dropping their school of education. Um, Berkeley has a little different governance system, but the faculty senate at Berkeley, are, they call themselves, at least then they did, the barons. And they really ran the place the way the senate here does not run the university. That's not to say the senate isn't important. I was vice chair of the senate once. But the, um, uh, after I left the deanship. But the, um, the point here is that Heyman, and I heard him speak more than once, was always looking at Yale and Princeton, talking about Cal in that context. And I think you find that you, well, I was told anyhow, that maybe the most important thing I did as Dean of Education at Stanford was save the Berkeley School of Education. <laughs> because uh, Don Kennedy, was, um, and Derek Bach at Harvard, were taking the lead, Shapiro then at uh, Michigan, but soon to go to Princeton. Um, um, they were taking the lead in trying to build up their schools of education. And in that climate, um, Heyman couldn't do what Chicago did, Duke did, dropped their schools of education. So. Some people say that's the most important thing I've done. Well, pretty important. So I've got one more topic I want to put on the table, then I want to open it up, open the conversation up. Um, I'm very intrigued by the other paper that I sent around uh, a couple weeks ago on planning educational programs for Generation R. Um, there's a lot that's so interesting in that paper, we could have a whole conversation just about that one piece. It's a history lesson, it's a philosophy lesson, it's a curriculum lesson, it's a lesson in moral responsibility and a whole lot more. But what I want to ask you about is that you're, in your reference to Generation R, you say that the R stands for responsibility. Now, I did a little research for this conversation, and what I found was that Generation R, at least according to the internet, was coined by a New York Times reporter, and that in his version, R stood for recession, as in the Great Recession. And Generation R in this narrative is far more concerned with getting a good job than it is with environmental stewardship, which is, of course, what you talk about in the chapter. So it's sort of a strikingly contrasting view of what fuels this generation. Is it responsibility or is it recession? Well, very interesting question. Um, all I sent out was my chapter 29 of a, <laughs> uh, of a book on Generation R. But the person who did the foreword of the first chapter gets into this, mm. all of the different ways that Generation R has been used. Uh, and the editors of this book um, chose Generation R for responsibility, which is one of them, um, if you look you do the searches. Um, but that struck me as uh, inspired, in a way, because another theme in that paper is demography. When you're born, mm -hmm. where you're born. Excuse me. Um, 
Yeah, so we've got a generation born in the late 1900s, uh, early 2000s, maybe the next few years, and they have no choice because of when they're born but to take responsibility for this planet and what's going to happen to it. I mean, if it's odd to say we'll be rescued by our children and grandchildren, but the um, two of whom are here and about whom uh, I thought a great deal as I was, um, as I was writing this. It was evident. Um, they, they need to take responsibility um, for, or again, earlier part of our conversation, we were talking about this, uh, this kind of thing. So I found, I, I, jo I, took, a, I took a second look um, when I was invited to write a chapter, um, but uh, then I got used to it and I, I liked it. Um, and the notion of taking responsibility and how do we teach responsibility. And, uh, and then I get, as you know, into issues of where you're born, when you're born. I mean, the fact that I grew up in the Great Depression, um, you know, they, it's in the paper, but <clears throat> you grew up in the Great Depression, your father's unemployed. The schools don't list it on their uh, curriculum. But they taught, when I was 10 years old, they taught savings in school. How'd they do that? Um, every child in my, when I was 10 years old, so it must have been, what, fifth grade, whatever it is. Um, anyhow, um, every child had to open a bank account, okay? On Monday, you, and it was done through the school. You, fill, you never went to the bank. You filled out the papers in the classroom, gave it to the teacher. Then on Monday, you bring in a nickel, a dime, or a quarter. Somebody, the teacher, somebody, the clerk in the school, takes this money to the bank. On Thursday, you get your bank book. It's how much you uh, save. You learn that if you accumulate $18.75, you get a United States savings bond that in 10 years will be worth $25. It gave new meaning to the word interest. And it made you interested. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. um, and so, again, it's not in the curriculum. The schools taught savings. The schools, I mean, they've got to teach about the environment. They've got to get into things, uh, that was crucial, of course, in the Great Depression. That's how we got into teaching, incidentally. Um, teachers had jobs. Um, so I figured, and I, I was a chemistry major at City College uh, in New York. And uh, so I went into teaching because no matter what happened, I thought I'd have a job. Right. Of course, things have changed. But So even then, getting a job was a, an imperative for your job. Yeah, but after the war. Yeah, after the war. I mean, so much that I don't want to get too annoying about this. But I'm born in 1927. My best friend in high school, one of my best friends in high school, was born in 1926. So he's drafted a year before I am. He gets killed in the Battle of the Bulge. You know, one year later, um, uh, I, the Navy sends me to, uh, uh, I get into the Navy because I passed some math tests besides my, despite my poor eyesight. But they needed electronic technicians. Um, anyhow, by the time I'm drafted, the war is over in Germany. While I'm in boot camp, the war is over in Japan. But I collect GI Bill. I mean, my friend gets killed. I've got the GI Bill. I get a PhD. And then, as I said earlier, all you needed was a good pulse rate to get into a good university in the 1950s. So um, a lot depends on things you have no control over. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is too much fun. I'm, I'm, I'm hogging all your time now. I want to open up the conversation. I'm sure people have comments, observations, questions. Um, and we have, uh, uh, your grandson's name is oh, Mike? Yeah, Michael will bring the microphone around yes. to people. Mike is small, so we can dart under <laughs> tables and get the microphone to you. So I don't want to introduce his big sister, Elizabeth. Mike, can you go back there? Stand up, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> That's how tall she's got. Michael, not, not Myron. Huh? 
Um, that's another story. <laughs> and my daughter-in-law, Betsy Carter. Welcome. Glad you could come. Shelly. Hi, Mike. Thanks so much for talking with us. I do have a question. I've always been a big admirer of your work on action research. And the, so you can't hear me with this. Yeah, yeah I hear it. Oh, it's, okay. my, it's my hearing. It's okay. Um, my question is, at, where do you see, given the current context of schools and the current context of education research, action research fitting in? Does it still have a niche? Does it, is it something we can still think about and work toward? work with teachers on? <clears throat> well, I, I certainly think so. Um, the, um, oh, but the kind of action research that I gravitate toward is groups of teachers working together and sharing ideas. Um, so uh, one of the things we did in the study of Stanford in the schools, for example, I guess I mentioned it, I was working with a group of mentor teachers and they brought to the table and I was a facilitator. Beverly Carter was working with me as well. And we did a book on this, incidentally, she and I, a pamphlet, um, with the teachers. A lot of it is their writing. But the, um, so these experienced teachers, we had a mentor program in this state at that time, and um, about six of them across fields. Um, some were science teachers, some were English teachers, history teachers. But they, the topic was mentoring. And so they would bring puzzlements. They would bring ideas to the group. And the group would then talk about them and buy into a few and decide, we're going to try something. And then bring back to the group the results of whatever it is we tried. So action research has a, well, that started in social work. Kurt Lewin is credited. In the, in the 1930s, a social worker, with uh, refining the concept, and it's really taken off uh, for a couple of decades. I don't know where it stands today as a field. But pe peers have the opportunity to learn from one another by trying things in their own classroom, bringing the results, discussing it, trying again. Um, my first doctoral student here, uh, Alan Feldman, did a study, uh, his doctoral study, wasn't it, Lee? It was on action research from physics by physics teachers. Lee provided a lot of help. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the short answer to your question. And it has a life, it has theory all its own now. I don't know how common it is in today's stressed environment where um, a certain kind of testing is the norm. I, it implies, doing it implies a certain degree of confidence that the teachers can do this, a lot of this by themselves. But we had it here, Misty Sato, yeah. Janet Coffey, others worked in action research groups with local teachers in projects that I had after I was liberated from the deanship. Derek, Mike, where's Mike in the, in the microphone? Mike, the microphone man. I can yell. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So, um, this is great fun, Mike. Thank you. And Claude, thank you for masterful. Michael, please get the microphone to. <laughs> so she doesn't strain her voice. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Gotcha. So, um, I, in the last, the 11 years that I've been here, uh, I think, well, actually, before I came here, I think the, the practice interest was well firmly planted and uh, it has grown over the last decade but I, I, I think that one of the things I've noticed is that the, the, the doctoral students have shifted a little bit in where they came from and what their interests are so I'd say even as recent as 11 years ago when I came there were far more doctoral students who came from discipline, so they were interested in studying the sociology of education with an emphasis on sociology or the psychology of education or, or history um, or anthropology. And now, more and more, they're interested in solving a problem. And so when you read their statements, they want to study school reform and they want to study improving teachers or something that is 
it's cast more in a practical issue or an educational issue than it is in a kind of discipline-based orientation. What I have seen also, Eamon and I were talking about this the other day, is a waning interest in the humanities. Um, less interest, it appears, in history and philosophy. And I think perhaps it's because they want to go out and solve problems. And that seems like a distraction. What I think you have spoken so eloquently about is that it's not a distraction at all. It's a critical piece of being able to address problems. Um, can you give me thoughts about what we need to do as a school to help students understand the importance of history and philosophy and the humanities in addressing the kinds of practical issues that they're, they're concerned about in the, in the field of education? And model this kind of, um, I would like to think that my Generation R paper, I hope, models some of this kind of intellectual view. I mean, I rely so heavily on history, <coughs> philosophy, arts uh, as well uh, in that. So I mean, more modeling by fact. Faculty, I, but that's I. I wasn't aware of that, Deborah. That uh, maybe that's my view. I don't know yeah. other faculty would have seen the same drift. That's an interesting point. Yeah, to... if we have other comments on that, Eamon, and other people on one way, way in, it seems to me a pretty a pretty central question that Deborah's posed. Elliot, uh, uh, he, Michael's coming. Mike's coming. <laughs> the mics are coming. <laughs> You have to push a button, I think. Of. It seems to me that when you think about the humanities, you're thinking about a, an array of fields whose existence and whose utility isn't shedding fresh light, new perspectives, other ways of thinking about things than conventional forms in the social sciences. So when one asks what can the humanities do for a school, it can help enlighten the people who make educational policy. It can examine the questions of what do we get out of poetry that we don't get elsewhere, but which is important to have. That means that there has to be a place in a graduate school of education, especially a great graduate school of education, uh, of those resources that students can use in the process of acquiring a master's or a PhD. So I think there are plenty of uses, but there's been a separation, uh, and part of the separation is due to the ways in which the function of schools of education should should operate what they should be. There's more to say about it. But what, what thoughts on this? Yeah, Lee. Can I do a slight change of topic? Or do you want to pursue Okay with you? Yeah. Um, we give you permission. Mike, some of your greatest times in Illinois were working with colleagues like Bob Karplus on the reform of science curriculum. And it was during a period in the 60s and 70s that was probably unparalleled across the, the country in the emphasis on curriculum reform, especially in science and math, somewhat in social sciences. Um, that doesn't seem to be happening much anymore. Uh, reform seems to be happening through mandated assessments and uh, other initiatives. Would you reflect a bit on your days as a curriculum reform person, what you see as the longer term impact of curriculum reform in science, and uh, whether you think perhaps there's a need to emphasize that again now, or that's not where we ought to be going. 
Yeah, you know, it's... <clears throat> See, what you had, as many of you know, is you had a critical period starting in the 1950s um, where America suddenly got a little frightened by the launch of Sputnik 1 by the Soviets. And so they decided to pour, through the National Science Foundation, pour a lot of money into development, enough money to attract important people. But actually, before Sputnik, the Carnegie Corporation, under John Gardner, in the early 1950s, um, began to support curriculum development at Illinois, Max Bieberman, to create a math uh, curriculum for kids. Now, the, the guiding concept here was that we want to teach the subject as, as it is seen by its most practiced and accomplished people, outstanding mathematicians, uh, for example, uh, outstanding physicists. And again, before Sputnik, um, Gerald Zacharias at MIT assembles a group of scientists who, not incidentally, were central in the Manhattan Project. And they, uh, they created the atom bomb. And um, they were awed at what they had done. And they decided that they would devote their careers, in good part, to shaping a new generation who would understand the science. Uh, uh, how they got there through that reasoning is education is so crucial in developing uh, any kind of a society. So, um, uh, even our, uh, and I was the director of an astronomy, a co-director, pardon me, of an astronomy project with an astronomer. The first project NSF supported below the high school level. Um, and my co-PI was Bob Karplus, oh, I'm sorry, to get to Karplus in a minute, was a guy named Stan Wyatt. And we reconceptualized um, astronomy. And, in the spirit of the times, for one summer we had a Nobel Prize winner in physics from Berkeley, Owen Chamberlain, working with us. And I was amazed at the conversation that these people had about what should be taught to elementary and junior high school kids in astronomy, that it was a challenging intellectual exercise for them to ferret out what's truly basic in their, in their fields. So I don't know how, what got me from you to this, but that's where these ideas lead me. So today, um, Don Kennedy, when he, uh, co-directed the study of Stanford in the schools with me um, was himself conditioned by his experience during the academic institutes that Paul Hurd, a great science educator who was here before I came as uh, dean, Paul Hurd used to organize groups of scientists and teachers on the Stanford campus to teach them about modern ideas in science. But it takes um, it takes the people at the top of the field. It's hard today for a young scientist to get started. Um, it's uh, so much depends. You apprentice yourself, I guess it's not called an apprenticeship, but it is, uh, to an outstanding scientist at Stanford. And you learn a whole lot of things, like half your time is spent working on the next grant. Um, you're learning, you're, you're learning a lot besides the science. You're learning how to do science in modern day America, how dependent that is on sizable uh, resources. Some people are discouraged. I don't know what got me into this, but it's, it's harder to get involved because of the time necessary to be a great scientist and the need to get the money. You go to, a, I did a lot of work at UCSF and wearing my program evaluation hat. Um, and a lot of it after I retired, actually. Uh, program evaluation is a big field, incidentally. Anybody who's looking for some area where you're easily employed, let me know. Um, 
anyhow, the people are always looking for evaluators. And I was involved with UCSF on four of their projects. <clears throat> and one of the things that we found out is that some of the scientists who work with us were indeed uh, PhD students in various labs around UCSF. And they were so discouraged about what being in a lab is like that they decided they wanted to go more into teaching, partly because of this contact with the evaluators from Stanford. And so a sizable number of them uh, go on into places that they're not encouraged to go to by their faculty at UCSF who want them to rep go to other research universities. Mike, picking up a, a, a bit on Lee's question, um, do you, what kind of shifts do you, have you seen or do you see now in science education or science pedagogy? I mean, there's, in the past few years it seems to me there's a much more of emphasis on the language of science, learning how to engage in the discourses of science that scientists engage in, in contrast to learning, not instead of certainly, but in contrast to emphasizing concepts and facts and laws and theorems and so forth, really engaging in a community of scientists. And that's, as an outsider, because I'm not in science education, it seems to me that's sort of a shift that has taken place over the past 10, 20 years. Do, do you see that same sort of shift? Do you see that kind of changing focus on what it means to be a science educator and teaching science? I would say, if you look at the journals, uh, a lot of the work is tries to hew to what's considered a scientific standard. Um, Jonathan is a big exception. Jonathan Osborne, who um, has done a lot of very important work on what should be taught, uh, looking at it from the point of view of what can we do with the a great number of people who are not going to go into science, but who might find use for science perspectives in other ways in their lives. And one really ought to talk with Jonathan about that. But if you look at the journals, very little of that is reflected. Uh, it looks like um, the journals in science education. Uh, this is epitomizes it for me. Um, a recent graduate of this institution, well, Janet Coffey, <clears throat> um, does a stunning paper for the leading, I think, a stunning paper for the leading research journal um, and submits it to the leading research journal in science teaching. And she tries to apply a broad perspective. Incidentally, it's going to be published as the lead article in the January issue, if that hasn't already come out. But the editor first said, um, we'd like it, and we'd like it a lot, but update your references. Why? She had a reference to John Dewey. In other words, the, the, the state of mind of these journal editors is such that they're looking for pieces that look like scientific research. And science changes every decade. And so get your references up to date. So she made the reference to John Dewey. She had to bring it up to date. How's that? <laughs> That's a perfect segue for me. I, I don't need this, my question. Uh, John Dewey said in 1910, the problem with the teaching of science is that it's too much about science, definitions and so on, and too little about doing science. That's a paraphrase, but it's pretty accurate. And it strikes me, Mike, that when I read uh, the papers that you've written, uh, and uh, the other curriculum research, that this has been an, uh, a shuttling back and forth, a kind of constant thing about the discipline of science, uh, learning about science as opposed to what do scientists do, the inquiry method, and so on like that. That strikes me as a reductionist, but not a bad capturing of science curriculum reform over the past century. I think that's accurate, Larry. I mean, uh, it goes back and forth. Uh, that, that is, the rhetoric is one level, but the practice is often at a different level. True enough. But it's more than just the gap between 
uh, the official curriculum and the learned curriculum or the taught curriculum. It's more about what the uh, opinion leaders in science education think ought to be done with kids and teachers. And that usually is imposed. You know, the, uh, the, the Zacharias, the curriculum reform in physics, biology, and chemistry, and so on like that. And the current thing about the inquiry method, and uh, it's a well, constant kind of oscillation back and forth. Yeah, if you look at it historically, the, um, I have nothing to add to that. Okay. Jonathan. Well, yeah, I'll add something to that because I think, Larry, you're right, there has been a kind of constant confusion of constant confusion. Michael, uh, Jonathan, um, if you could just repeat that, please. Uh, there's been constant confusion. Part of the constant confusion has been simply because people have confused the doing of science with the learning of science, which have got different goals. Uh, but they somehow think that the two should be synonymous. They reduce the doing of science to basically empirical inquiry, where any scientist will tell you that actually that's only a small-ish element of their work, and that a lot of it's about focused on reading, writing, and talking science, hence the, I think the contemporary emphasis on paying more attention to that, but that's still a long struggle in that kind, kind of way. So, uh, and sorting out that confusion, I think, is what you can see in the, the kind of oscillating pendulum between an emphasis on content and an emphasis on process. And I think we're still trying to sort it out is the, the best description of it. Uh, I, I was just sort of ask one question, please, Mike. If you think back on your career and the work that you've done, which piece of work are you most pleased with? Uh, and the second question is, which piece of work do you think has had the most impact? And are the two the same? And if not, why not? I missed the first one. The second one was about impact. And yeah, well, the first one is, which, which piece of work have you done which you're most pleased with in your career? What I enjoyed the most. <laughs> oh, it's hard to sing aloud. I really have been lucky. and I. But anyhow, um, the fact that the question comes from you, um, the most satisfaction was co-directing with Paul Black an international study through the OECD of innovations in science, math, and technology education. Um, we had uh, 12 countries, and our method of choice was case study. So what we did was, this was enormously illuminating for me, we had an expert on case study, Michael Huberman, uh, was a member of the group. Bob Stake was a member of the advisory group. And um, it was revealing to look at what was happening in Japan, in Schleswig-Holstein, one Landa in Germany, uh, in Spain. It was very satisfying. It was an eye-opener for me about A, the uses of case study, and B, the variety in innovations that were going on around the world. Don't know that I'm answering your question, but it was a very stimulating for me to write with Paul, one of two things I've done with him, um, about um, the trying to summarize these case studies. Uh, that book was called um, had a title, Changing the Subject. Changing the subject, uh, it turns out that every country is trying to change what they're doing in science, math, and technology, um, but they're doing it in different ways. Um, I won't go any further on that, but you asked me that kind of, I don't know if that was responsive. Then another, again, I look at Jonathan, I think of Paul, because Paul was Jonathan's advisor. Um, Joe's too, did she leave? There she is, also Joe's advisor. <clears throat> um, Paul uh, and I did a professional memoir, um, which we called Inside Science Education Reform, in which we looked at um, our experiences, mine here and his in the UK, in changing curriculum. I think you asked me about, that's what I've enjoyed. What, and really, I, I, to confess, I've enjoyed just about everything I've done. 
except fifth grade science. Fifth grade science, right. And then the other part of this question was, which one do you think has had the most impact, or the impact that you're most proud oh, of? Oh, I don't know about impact. It's hard. It's so hard. I don't know how you trace impact. I think the committee you chaired, Beyond 2000, and the work you did in Europe, I think likely, if you tell me, do you think they had much impact? From my distance, it looks like they might have. He said he'd find it very hard to answer that question. Right, well, we throw the ponds, uh, pebbles in the pond, the ripples go, we know not where. Anyway, we're over our time. Thank you all very much, and thank you especially to Mark Ashley for a very stimulating conversation. Thank you.